Hey everyone, thanks for joining our 26th webinar of 2022 as part of our Patient Ambassador Program. This webinar is highlighting housing and transplantation and aims to help our viewers navigate their pre, during, and post-transplant housing journeys. My name is Anna morgan Polardi. I am the Program and Communications Director here at the Chris Kluth Foundation, and I will be introducing today's panelists and moderating this webinar. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors, Hearts for Russ, who make this webinar series possible. And a little housekeeping, so if you're new to Zoom, uh, you will notice that you have a Q&A box to field questions to the web uh, panelists. It, uh, we will have a brief Q&A at the end, so we encourage you to type your questions as they come to mind so that we can answer them all at the end. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Up first, we have Talia, who is the Director of Family Services and Caregiver Lifeline Program at the Gift of Life Family House, a lodging facility for patients and their families receiving solid organ transplants uh, related treatment. Talia has received her master's uh, for social work degree from University of Pennsylvania and is licensed to practice clinical social work in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Thank you for being here, Talia. Then we have Elaine. Elaine is co-founder and executive director of Transplant House of Cleveland, a nonprofit organization that provides affordable temporary housing and a welcoming, supporting, supportive community to organ transplant patients and their families. Elaine's family personal experience uh, during her and after her father's successful liver transplant recipient a uh, transplant in Cleveland Clinic in 1992 is the cause for her interest in bringing this vital form of support to those who are pursuing an organ or bone marrow transplant in Cleveland. Denise Redica is a uh, 2018 heart transplant recipient, patient advocate, organ donation advocate, and founder for Heartfelt Health Foundation. Founded in 2020, Heartfelt Health Foundation helps San Francisco Bay Area transplant recipients both afford and source medically required post-transplant housing. That for the most house transplant patients, uh, recipients necessitates relocating temporarily to within a short distance of their hospital. Finally, Teresa Rainey. Teresa received her first heart transplant recipient in 2009. During this hard time, she stayed in the then new pediatric facility at the JW on Kaiser premise. Teresa spent 12 years with a heart, uh, completely rejection free before she was diagnosed with CAB with her major artery blocked in 2021. She received her second heart transplant in October of 2021. And this time it was not an easy process. Luckily, Heartfelt Health Foundation was there to help. Teresa is now nine months post transplant and runs her own company with her sister. Thank you all for being here, and I'm super excited to get a chance to talk to you all and pick your brains a little bit. Um, so before we get started, just a quick background on CKF. So we are a 501c3 national nonprofit based here in Aspen, Colorado, that works to inspire and educate young people on the importance of organ, eye, and tissue donation. CKF uses inspirational stories and educational facts to encourage individuals to make the life-saving decision to register as an organ donor. CKF runs a number of programs across the United States to help promote organ donation and support transplant the transplant community. Our Patient Ambassador Series, Donor Stories and Bounce Back Give Back Award it's all help to inspire those in the transplant community while our free national curriculum and Donor Dudes events aim to educate on the importance of organ of becoming an organ donor. So let's get started with some questions. Denise, I'm gonna start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the Heartfelt Health Foundation? What area do you service and how do you work to help recipients and their families? Well, good morning, Anna, at least good morning for me. Um, <laughs> I uh, am so grateful to be here and be part of this really important conversation. Housing um, and transplantation is, uh, a huge issue and one that um, I am grateful we get to address today. Uh, Heartfelt Help Foundation was founded in 2020 um, in Northern California to help transplant patients with the costs associated with transplant housing that insurance doesn't cover. Here in the Bay Area, that post-transplant housing um, near to the transplant hospitals can be upwards of 300 
sometimes more than $450 a night. And there are very few people that can afford that. So we get to step in and help with those costs. And we help find, help patients both find the right kind of housing for them and pay for it. Wonderful. And do you help the recipient's family as well, or is it mostly directed at the recipient? It's the recipient and the family because the caregiver, um, the, the patient being able to recover in a place that feels like home with the people who feel like home is how recovery begins well for a transplant patient. As a transplant patient myself, I know that my recovery would have been significantly different if I didn't have the people that felt like home, my family around me um, as I began the recovery process. So it is a whole family. This whole process beginning to end is a whole family process. And we, um, we include the whole family in the dynamic of what we do here at Heartfelt Health Foundation. That is so true. It is, it's really community. It's everybody. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Elaine, tell us a little bit about the Transplant House of Cleveland um, and how you work to help uh, recipients and their families. There we go. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's um, really meaningful to be connected with people all across the country that are doing such similar work and caring about the transplant uh, population and journey. Um, so the where of the question you asked is Cleveland, Ohio. So Transplant House of Cleveland is sitting in Cleveland, Ohio. That's where I am right now. Um, but I'll quickly address the who first. And we serve patients and their caregivers at any phase of the transplant journey from those very early first appointments where doctors are discerning whether this patient is a good candidate for transplant or not, um, all the way through to waiting and, and actively at the time of transplant, post-transplant, and then years after when patients come back for uh, well checkups, I like to call them. Um, and our physical space is 25 fully furnished apartments and then a house that constitutes community space. And Anna, you mentioned community just a minute ago. So to us, it's half about needing an affordable place to stay and half about the community that helps you sustain yourself during this journey. Um, we here at Transplant House find that a probably more of our attention is focused on the caregiver than on the patient for obvious reasons. The patient has doctors, nurses, all sorts of professionals caring for them. For some of the journey, the patient is inpatient um, and the caregiver is mandated, as everyone here knows, you have to have at least one um, verifiably competent caregiver throughout the process. And yet no one's really thinking about caring about the caregiver. So. Um, and I know Talia will probably speak to that too, that that's where a lot of our attention ends up being. Um, and we, um, the other part of your question about geography, we in 2021 served patients from 33 different states across the nation. Um, but equally as important to us is serving local transplant patients who don't need the bed because they live nearby. But as uh, we've been told by local people, just because I live near Cleveland Clinic or University Hospitals doesn't mean this wasn't the most isolating experience of my life. Um, so we do have programs um, such as our AA support group that um, bring in local transplant patients as well. So I'll pause there. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you guys for everything that you do. It's, uh, it's amazing. I think what you summed up there, it is a really pre, during, and post, it's, it's never ending. And to have um, organizations that support the family through that process, as well as the recipient. And like you said, everybody's supporting the recipient who's supporting the caregiver because they go through hell and back trying to give everything to that recipient. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa, I wanna move to you. Just uh, tell us about your, uh, tell us about the gift of life, family house, and what you, the, oh, sorry. Talia, sorry, my <laughs> mistake there. <laughs> Getting my names Hi, mixed up. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's okay. We both, There's both too many T's. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, so very similar to what Elaine said, our program really supports solid organ transplant patients and their families, especially who travel into Philadelphia 
for their transplant treatment. Uh, we serve eight transplant hospitals here in Philly. So we're a very large uh, transplant center um, or city, I should say. And um, many of our centers are very large transplant centers and transplant over 500 patients a year. Um, so we have thousands of patients that come into the city annually for treatment. Um, and some of our aggressive centers are a center of last resort for patients. So a patient who may be um, not meet the age requirements um, or medical requirements at a smaller transplant hospital closer to their home, they then have an opportunity to come to Philly to a more aggressive center um, that would um, potentially list them. So when those patients come here, you know, it's either the family house um, or Gift of Life Howie's house, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, um, or um, no, there's no other option if they can't get listed here. So uh, we have 32 rooms at Gift of Life Howie's house. Uh, so we are formerly known as Gift of Life Family House and recently changed our name to honor our uh, first president and CEO um, who's been with Gift of Life for I think over 40 years now and really um, had the dream of building this house to support uh, transplant patients and their families. And we're an affiliate of our OPO, uh, Organ Procurement Organization Gift of Life donor program here um, in the region. So in addition to um, the room, uh, we also provide meals every night. We have shuttle, a uh, shuttle to all of the transplant centers. And like Elaine and Denise mentioned, we're really here to support the families. Um, so the rest of the facility is communal. So we have a very large dining room, um, a laundry room, a kitchen, a living space, lounges, uh, activity center, fitness center. Um, so we have all this space to really encourage families and patients to meet one another and support one another because as many of you know, it is extremely important to feel like you're connected to others who are going through or who have gone through um, the process. Um, additionally, since not everyone will stay at the family house or Howie's house for their treatment, uh, we started a caregiver lifeline program to address uh, the support and education needs of caregivers and patients, both nationally and internationally. So we offer um, monthly webinars on different transplant topics. Um, we have two coming up um, both one in August and September um, that I think Anna will share information about um, that anyone can sign up for. And then we have multiple virtual support groups that are led by our licensed social workers. Um, so that, you know, if you live in an area where you don't have access to support groups, um, you can join our groups and, and connect to other patients and caregivers virtually. Um, so like Elaine mentioned, you know, it's very important that we build this community. And I think these calls are really wonderful for that because our communities go beyond just our region and our area and housing and support um, and education needs are everywhere. And um, it's, you know, as many patients, like there's 100,000 people on the wait list. So we really should be supporting 100,000 people um, every day so that they can get access to um, support and lodging um, and community. Yes, definitely. I think that um, having those connections and these sort of talks just opens it up. And if you haven't heard about this area before, it introduces it to you and, and provides a little more education. And I'll share those links um, towards the end in the chat for everybody so that they can head to the webinars and join in another conversation um, to talk a little more about what we get up to. Um, so Teresa, can you tell us about your experience as a transplant recipient? Um, you have a slightly different perspective to everybody else. Um, with housing, how do you feel that it changed your transplant journey as opposed yeah. to if you hadn't? Yeah, um, well, I'm obviously very thankful for all of the people who are here um, who offer those opportunities to support transplant patients because um, I know Denise touched on it a little bit, but um, that experience um, pre and post is like extremely stressful as the actual recipient to have to think about organizing and arranging housing because 
I am the first time that I had my transplant back in 2009, I was actually required to live near my doctor for three months. Um, and I lived over three hours away. And so um, I was required to find housing um, down in the Bay Area that was extremely expensive, expensive that you know, I'm obviously not working and then that's placed, that stress is placed on my family. Um, so I was like super fortunate the first time that um, I actually was able to stay at a facility that I just opened that wasn't necessarily directed for transplant patients, um, but was kind of like that home away from home um, for pediatric patients. It was on Kaiser's facility um, and my social worker was able to help arrange um, that. And then the second time um, that I had my transplant, I uh, had a little bit more time prior um, to having the transplant. And so I was able to do a little bit of legwork on the beginning side and kind of like look into some of these organizations that offer assistance, um, was able to connect with Denise and Health Help Foundation. And um, she really was the one that kind of connected with my family, took the lead so that when I um, had got the call and had to go through um, my surgery and recovery and all of that, I, I wasn't having to worry about those pieces. Um, she, you know, and neither was my family. She was able to set it all up and arrange things. And um, I just think that alleviating that stress um, you know, there's a lot of pieces that go into recovery. Uh, obviously, your medications, your doctors, um, your surgeons, all of that. But I think your mental state is a huge part of it. Um, and anywhere you can relieve um, stress specifically and provide that like healthy environment and encouraging and being able to just focus on getting better and having your support system be able to help you focus on that as well, I just think is super important. That's wonderful. Yeah, no, I think that um, you summed it up there. I think a lot of people don't realize you are often required to move. It's not a choice. It's not like everybody wants to just up and move right. their whole life and move. And it is you know. a requirement. And the more that we can help relieve the stress of the patients and their families, the quicker the whole process can be. Because, you you know, if you're stressed, you're not going to feel better. <laughs> right. Well, and like Denise said, it's something that's not covered um, completely by insurance. So if that's something that you have to, you are required to do it, but you have to come up with the funds to be able to afford that. So yeah, definitely. And then, so moving back to Elaine, why do you feel it is critical to discuss housing more with patients and their families? Do you feel it's talked about enough with the doctors? Do you think we could capitalize on this a little more? How do you think we can help? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'd be speculating about how much the doctors are talking about it because I'm not sure, you know, I'm not there. Um, I know our two hospitals here are good about at least mailing information about housing to patients when they anticipate coming in. But of course, not everybody has a lot of lead time for a transplant, right? Some, some come under very urgent circumstances and housing is clearly one thing that can be overlooked, particularly in those urgent situations. Um, so, I mean, it's important probably first and foremost because it can make the difference between somebody actually pursuing transplant or not. Um, so if somebody told me I had to go to California or Philly or anywhere else um, for a transplant, if I didn't already work in this um, world, I would think that that's not an option for me then. Um, between airfare or other modes of travel and then the housing, I just think a lot of families say that's for somebody else. It's not for me. You know, I, I don't have that opportunity. So it can just make or break um, somebody's life being saved by an organ transplant. Um, and further, as we're all alluding to or speaking to directly, um, being in the community can significantly impact the outcome of that transplant. So as we all know, if your family's nearby, if they feel safe, if they feel settled, if they understand the process, um, you know, at, at all these houses, we have people that help you navigate both the city, which can be extremely overwhelming, but the hospital system 
and the language of transplant. Um, there's just so much that's new. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the housing very naturally, I know Denise, with her personal experience, you extend all of that, even though you don't have a central house, you extend all of your awareness and your experience to these families. So I'm sure it's more than just helping them afford that place to stay. And um, if, yeah, if the family feels secure and informed, uh, the outcomes are going to be better. Um, so there's there's a lot of that peripheral care that's being done outside the hospital. Um, and I would say one of our great challenges is the hospital understanding that how much care is being given and what an impact it makes. It's, it's hard to um, quantify it, but we see it on a daily basis. Yeah, I think that you summed it up though. when coming into the community, it's my first year really getting involved and I just came back from the transplant games and you know, you hear all of these different terminologies it really is learning it's a completely new language just to understand and having somebody that walks you through all these difficult things um that isn't family but can provide that for your family is is amazing it's it's really really needed i think um so denise moving back to insurance a little bit obviously housing as we've mentioned is not often covered by insurance how can transplant recipients uh, combat this? And what do what resources do they have to support them through to afford this housing? Um, well, insurance is a complicated issue. It just is. And everybody's got a different policy. Um, the joy of the US is that um, there are as many different policies almost as there are people. Um, and every policy does a little something different. Um, some policies provide absolutely no coverage for post-transplant housing, even though it's medically required. Um, it's considered non-medical because insurance draws a border around the hospital. So they'll cover the surgery and the room and the board and the meds, but they won't cover anything that they deem to be outside of the medical spectrum. Um, and that's where problems come in, because if you don't have insurance to cover it and you don't have the funding, um, there are there are and I've seen them. Situations where your status on the transplant list can be pushed back because you don't have sufficient funds, you're told um, we've worked with patients here in California that have been told to go home and have a bake sale. Um, to raise money. That is stress that should not be given to a patient that is in heart failure facing a heart transplant. Um, it just shouldn't be. There are organizations. Yes, you can do a GoFundMe. Yes, there's an organization called Help Hope Live that's kind of a transplant specific GoFundMe. Um, but those require family participation too, which adds to family stress. Somebody has to set it up. Somebody has to monitor it. Somebody has to be participating, continually updating, blah, blah, blah. Um, here at Heartfelt Health Foundation, we want to at least take the, the burden of, of finding and sourcing the right kind of housing. Because as Teresa kind of alluded to, um, every Everybody's different. Every every situation's different. Everybody's insurance situation is going to be a little bit different, um, and everybody's caregiver situation is going to be a little bit different. Um, for some patients, um, their parents are going to be their caregiver. They require a different kind of housing situation than someone that's a husband and wife situation. A parent child situation is going to be different than um, than a husband wife situation. So being able to look at the family as a whole and care for the family as a whole as we move through this trying process is um, a huge and integral part of what I think we're all trying to do um, because finding, finding housing that works for the family that creates the atmosphere that is most conducive for recovery for everybody. Um, when the family feels more comfortable, the patient feels more comfortable. Um, and, and recovery then happens a lot more smoothly. 
Um, and to kind of address, just to go back to address what you had asked of Elaine about how communication is from hospitals. I can tell you from personal experience that when I sat down with a transplant social worker, um, now four and a half years, oh, five years ago, about now, um, I was given an out of date piece of paper that had a list of hotels and a list of agreed partner pricing rates um, and told, here's your options. You have to deal with it. You, this, is, this is where you take it from here. And here's your piece of paper that has these lists of, of hotel names and phone numbers and the agreed upon rates. Except when we called them, we found out that most of those agreements were out of date. Actually, my husband, before we started our foundation, rewrote the entire <laughs> spreadsheet for that particular hospital because he was so frustrated during our experience that he rewrote the entire spreadsheet and updated it for them. I think while he was sitting by my hospital bed um, waiting for me to recover. Um, so, <laughs> which Anna, you've met Jim. This is, you would imagine this for him. Um, so, so the communication level, the, the, um, the ability to be able to step in and help with that needs to be, at least in my experience, needs to be updated and upgraded um, significantly. Yeah, I think you're already dropping a giant bombshell on somebody when you say you need a transplant, <laughs> let alone when you add all of this onto it. It's, it's, you know, and you're not giving them up to date information. It's something that we could work on and we really need to get better at and, and support them from all aspects. I love that Jim did that. That doesn't surprise me whatsoever. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Right. So <laughs> moving to Teresa, what advice would you give to a transplant recipient and their family who are currently looking for housing? Um, I would definitely say that if you have the opportunity to start looking early, there are things that are out there. These foundations are out there. Um, I know, like Denise said, it is true that when you speak with your social worker, I mean, I was like, I, I spoke about my first time, my social worker was different, you know, the two times um, she was a little bit more um, educated on some of those like nonprofit programs. And she's the one that connected me with um, the home away from home, the JW house that I got to stay in the first time. Um, but really, other than that, it is a list of hotels that you're offered kind of at um, prorated rates. And um, I was fortunate enough that my insurance covered like a small portion of it, um, but it's typically not all of the um, per night housing expense. Um, so the second time around, I knew that that wasn't necessarily going to be a guaranteed option to stay at the pediatric facility. It was, you know, had been 12 years and they had grown um, substantially. And so um, I kind of did my own research um, in reaching out to um, different organizations. There are um, organizations that offer scholarships. There are organizations that offer um, help with housing, um, help with other financial pieces that um, people are concerned about. Um, so if you have the opportunity to kind of start the conversations early, make the connections early so that when the time comes, um, you are able to not worry about it as much and kind of pass that along. Um, that's what I found kind of worked for me the second time around. Um, I do think that encouraging, because I know that that's not always an option and my first time, you know, I didn't have all that time in advance. And so um, I do think that bridging the gap of kind of like having these hospitals be able to, and social workers be able to partner better with like, you know, being more familiar with the organizations that are out there so that they can um, direct patients and their families to connect with them sooner. So that it's kind of taking out that research part for them, especially if they're like having to make the decision quickly um, or being faced with that uh, uh, surgery or transplant quickly, then that would be a big benefit. Definitely. And were there any particular um, 
references or research that you found or areas that you found particularly helpful? Were there any um, websites that you would send people to or is it just a general? Um, I did a lot of research like just through Google. I mean, that's, I had found um, a foundation, um, Ava's group. I think was in Southern California or Ava's house was in Southern California and they are who connected me with Denise um, because they kind of focused on um, the Southern California area and then um, Heartfelt Help um, focused on the Northern California chapter. Um, Trio Web is another one um, that I came across um, that um, actually helped like financially a little bit my first time around. Um, so really it's just, it's a lot of work. Um, you have to devote your time to it, but there are things out there. There are people who want to help. Um, but I do think that like, it's not always quite as easy to find. Um, so I guess the other thing I would say is um, not assuming that just because something says that it's, you know, for pediatrics, like my first time around, I never would have thought to look into JW house um, but a lot of times, like there's an exception, I've actually had um, the option, they've helped me since then, if they can, if they have availability, even though I'm not a pediatric patient, and I'm not even, I think they really focus more towards um, cancer patients. But because I've had a connection there, um, I have a contact and if they have availability and they're able to help out uh, for when I have to go down for a, um, a biopsy and I have to stay the night, uh, they will help find a room for me if they can. Um, so just not assuming that, oh, it's, you know, it's not specifically for transplants, so I can't look into it. Um, being open to all, all options is another um, suggestion I would have for other transplant patients. Yeah, definitely looking. Don't rule yourself out before reaching out. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Awesome. Talia, how can transplant recipients get transplant housing? How do they decide who they need to go through? Is there uh, re um, resources out there that they can look into? How does that work? Sure. And I just have so many responses to what everyone said, especially as a social worker myself. <laughs> and um, who's worked in medical social work. I think to just um, kind of piggyback off of everyone, um, like one theme here is that you have to have really, you have to be a really good advocate or have someone in your family who's an advocate. And it's unfortunate that that is how it has to be. But um, one of my main uh, goals here is to be our eight hospitals liaison. So like we're working very closely with our hospital partners. And unfortunately, there's just too many patients listed for the amount of like social workers or even coordinators. Um, additionally, there's always turnover. So you're just constantly like dealing with new people and, um, and you're dealing with younger people now who really don't have a lot of knowledge of transplant or um, end stage organ failure. So it really is crucial to have an advocate in your family or your support network. And um, we actually just had this one family and I just loved how they did it because they knew one person in the system, family system was really good at talking to medical people. So they had that person be the medical person. And then there was another person in their support network who was really good with finances and and like logistics. So that person handled like looking into housing and transportation. So it didn't feel like one person was responsible for everything. Granted, not all families are set up like that or support networks are set up like that. And it does often tend to be just one person who steps up and does everything, but it really is important to have an advocate. Um, and then, like what Teresa said, um, being your own advocate and reaching out places, um, even like she had mentioned, if you don't think it's a resource, there's a good chance that that resource might know of a different resource. So even if you call a cancer house, like when people call us looking for lodging for cancer treatment, I know of four different cancer houses that I refer them to. So you know, just asking questions to anyone and everyone on, um, you know, what resources might be available. Um, and then in addition to asking your uh, 
social worker and financial coordinator and coordinators um, and asking them all the same question because some of them might be more experienced than others in their transplant role. Um, and then finally, I always encourage people to get on um, social media. Like Facebook is a really good resource for community with private like transplant groups. Um, they're not support groups. So I always preface it with like, you know, they're not, they're led by other patients and family members. So, you know, if you have a emotional or um, mental health need, like that's not the place to go. Um, and they're also not your doctor. So it's important that, you know, you take uh, medical advice with a grain of salt and always talk to your medical team. But if you have a specific question about like resources or there was, I had this one issue or whatever, it's a really great place to just see what other patients or caregivers, um, how they got through that issue. So I always encourage people just from a community building standpoint and like resource building standpoint, um, to get online on some of those groups to see if, if anyone has any suggestions. And also I have to give a shout out, Bill Soloway, who is a heart recipient of I think six years and is also the president of TRIO in Philly. And he's also on our board here at the Gifts of Life House. So I know he's on the call right now. Oh, and yeah. Help Hope Lives. I'm pretty sure he's on the board of Help Hope Lives. <laughs> Yep, and he's a 2022 bounce back winner. He actually won our bounce back award this year. So he oh, is wow. flying out to spend some time with us in August. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Way to go, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> but yeah, I love what you were saying about social media is really, it's a new new thing coming on. And I think it is underutilized for really the people that you can reach through it. Um, you know, we use it all of, all of the time and there's some amazing support groups, uh, Transplant Life that we've worked with before, TRIO, there's a lot out there um, that people that have been through it and can help you and support you through it. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys uh, for answering everything. So uh, we do have the Q&A open if you want to send in some questions, um, but we have had some sent in before, so we'll start with those and then jump over to everybody else's afterwards. So do you feel that housing, this is a general to everybody, do you feel that housing is often overlooked through the transplant process, I'm assuming? So go for it. Yeah, I, I think it definitely is. And you know, one thought I had is listening to others and your question to Teresa about advice for other patients is don't overlook the opportunity to take advantage of transplant housing for all the reasons that we've outlined, right? All the benefits of it. But I find that there are people who feel they don't need it, either because financially they can afford the hotel that's right on the hospital campus. So they think that's a charity that's for someone else, or they think they've got this covered because they have family members with them. And as Talia just outlined, I've got somebody on the financial end and somebody you know, on the medical end for me. And yet they're depriving themselves of what happens when you sit across a dinner table from somebody that you don't have to explain yourself to. You know, There's somebody else with an oxygen tank or tubes of some kind, or you can just, you know, your eyes meet and you know that caregiver is feeling the same burden that I feel. And you may or may not end up talking about it, but that peer-to-peer -peer support is something that we all need, no matter how much money we have and how much family we have around us. Um, so it's, yeah, it's disappointing to me that some people say, no, I'll leave that opportunity for someone who needs it more than I do. Um, and even for those families that are, for whatever reason, just so grounded and sort of navigating really well without any outside support, they can help someone, right? So by you not choosing to enter this community, you're also not helping someone who needs it, you know, who, who has less than you. So um, yeah, I, I do think there is some uh, overlooking of it for sure. And I wanted to add to that to um, Elaine, like one of our goals here is to be in front of the medical teams as much as we can so that they're just constantly like, bombarded with our faces and remember who we are because there is a lot of turnover and even transplant patients who are in the ICU like they're not in the ICU with transplant ICU nurses they're in the 
ICU with ICU nurses. So making sure that everyone in the hospital is, is familiar with these resources for transplant patients. Um, but even beyond that, like getting in front of the transplant administrators, um, communicating with the trans with the hospital CEOs, um, because you know we have a, a significant resource to provide the patients that are going to their hospitals. And, you know, it's difficult to prove the quantitative, um, you know, impact like Elaine said, which we really as a group of transplant houses should, our uh, lodging resources should figure out how to do because we know that we offer a significant impact to the transplant process. Um, but just like showing in proof, like how important we are to their patients so that they're on board to really promote and support us within their organization. Um, we offer a lot of volunteer opportunities and we really encourage the hospitals to come and participate because it's a way for them to see firsthand like patients that they work with and how they're doing and beyond just the transplant um, teams, but like the ICU teams and the pulmonary rehab teams and uh, respiratory therapists. Um, and then when they do that, we try to share that with the hospitals like marketing team so that they could then share that internally. So we're just different ways to connect to the hospital teams um, to show the impact and importance of the services we do for their for their patients. Wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add on to what Talia was just saying? Well, just. I would, I would, the only thing I would add, because I 100% agree with both Elaine and Talia about what they said, is that um, housing becomes a critical issue for patients kind of at the last moment. They're dealing with their health concerns. They're dealing with heart failure. They're dealing with impending transplant and all the emotions that are carried along with that. That's huge and all consuming. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, there's this other component. There's this other thing that's happening. And with some cases, um, we've worked with families where the transplant um, social workers haven't really like brought up housing in a real and like you got to figure this out way until they're out of ICU and in a step down unit and they're looking at discharge in the next like week or so. And, and all of a sudden they're like, we've got a week to find housing. What are we going to do? Um, and that actually is a situation that we found ourselves in. Um, they had mentioned housing to us at one point early on in the process, but nobody had mentioned it again about what kind of housing, where, what the details were until we were about six days from discharge. Um, and in my particular story, and that's, I think mine is a little unusual, but in my particular story, um, we ended up finding something that worked and actually ended up finding something that is the same exact housing that we put Teresa into a few years later um, and her family into that worked for us, that was close, but it was practically accidental. It was practically a miracle um, that we found it. But that kind of thing is not the way it should happen on the regular. Um, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be something that is the norm for patients to go through is to have to deal with the recovery and the meds and the re potential rejection and the immunosuppression and the all the things that you have to deal with post-transplant and then have an extra added burden of having to figure out where you're going to relocate to. Um, in Northern California, we have something that's unique um, is that the vast majority of hospitals are on a peninsula and um, most hospitals require that their patients stay not only a few minutes away from the transplant hospital, but also that they cannot go over a bridge to go home. So they could live in theory, 20 minutes away from their transplant hospital and be able to go home. But if that home is over a bridge, they can't go. So, so there are all kinds of factors that work into whether or not a patient has to relocate, especially here in Northern California. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> That's an interesting fact. Um, so Natalie uh, just asked, tuning in from Nora, Nora's home in Houston, Texas, 
Um, they have a freestanding 32 suite facility for transplant families. We agree hospital partnerships are crucial. Any tips or ideas on how to keep connected with multiple transplant centers? I can just jump add on, well, I'm just going to add on to what I said earlier. This year, we actually um, developed a pretty significant goal um, in how we stay connected to their, our transplant hospitals. So we, had, we actually did focus groups with some of our um, transplant social workers um, just to hear like what would be helpful for them from us. Like we didn't want to overburden them or over communicate. And we found out some really interesting things. Like we used to send monthly data emails to the social workers that just um, showed like how much utilization their patients had. And they said that was not helpful because they didn't read it. And I thought that was great information because then I didn't have to do those emails anymore. Um, so what we did find is that Beyond just the social workers, other staff really need um, to be um, a part of some of these meetings. So we actually have, which is a goal of my teams, a mandatory five administrator meetings a year, five, I'm sorry, one administer, administrative meeting with the transplant administrators a year. So we have five main hospitals we work with out of the eight. So each administrator, we have a meeting with once a year. So it's like our annual meeting. So that's five meetings. We have one annual meeting with all of our transplant social work groups. So that's five transplant social work meetings. We do um, one staff meeting with all of the transplant teams. So some teams have, addition, have multiple staff meetings, like some of the bigger hospitals. So that's anywhere between like five and eight meetings. Um, and then other little groups here and there. So we have at least like 20 meetings a year with our hospital partners that are planned and um, we have presentations for. Um, and then beyond that for our social work goal, since we have two social workers on site here, our social workers are required to connect with transplant social workers for our long-term guests at least every two weeks. So we have ongoing communication with all of our social workers very frequently. Um, and part of that is so that we can best understand the medical situation of the patient. Um, and we do have uh, healthcare, we do have authorization signed by all patients to release medical information uh, for the hospital to release to us. Um, but it's also just to stay, um, to continue our relationship and, and relationship building with our social workers. Um, so, we have about 20 formal meetings and then probably monthly we have like five calls uh, with different social workers throughout the month. So I would encourage people to set up like standards for how they want it, how and when they want to communicate with their hospital partners, because I will say it's been very successful for us when we've had a really difficult patient issue um, or someone had to leave uh, because they hit the max time at our, like we are able to work with them to help transition the family somewhere else. So it's been a really great relationship um, building endeavor to have these like formal and informal contacts. We do the same thing um, at, uh, we, we maintain meetings, um, some virtual, some not, um, with the social workers at the four transplant facilities in Northern California, um, and we're constantly working on what fits for them. Um, right now, most of them are so understaffed that they are wanting us to minimize what we're asking of them, which is fine. They're all familiar with what we're doing. Um, but I agree with Talia 100% is that you just need to maximize communication and make sure you're in, in meetings with the team at least once a quarter. Yeah, I'll agree with all of that. Um, we've done some of what Talia outlined. We only have two transplant centers here, so it's not as onerous um, as it is out there in Philly. Um, a little more difficult to get meetings like that uh, over the last year, as Denise alluded. Um, another thing we've done, which is just 
simple but it seems to have great meaning is send um, gift baskets, goodie baskets over to key centers in the hospital um, with notes. So for the nurses, for the social worker, largely focused on the nursing staff, both on the post-transplant floor and in some of the ICUs. And we just recruit volunteers to help us bake. So it's a really beautiful looking basket with individually wrapped treats and our flyers so that these people remember to refer uh, guests to us. Um, so that's just a relatively simple thing to do. Um, another huge help to us is that we have several board members that are hospital staff at significant levels. So from the founding of this organization, we've had that and it's it. These are people that can get conversations with people inside the hospital, and that's been very, very helpful, um, as well as the fact that we hired a clinical transplant social worker who was at the Cleveland Clinic and is now with us. We did not recruit her away. She, <laughs> she came our direction, but um, she has relationships you know, with the social workers already at both the hospitals here, so that's a big help, but um, we also know that the staff turns over and people retire, so it is something that you have to keep at, even though we, we're familiar now, a year or two from now, it could be a very different picture. I do want to add on to that, too, and I love the baking idea, Elaine. We used to do that like years and years ago, but I guess COVID maybe has impacted that. Um, but one thing, and Bill, who's listening, could comment on this as well would be good. Um, we had talked about for a while, like almost having past guest like volunteer ambassadors almost. So people who had stayed here who continue to get their treatment at the um, transplant center who would then be sort of like trained in a way or educated in how they can market and talk about the facility so that they could really from a patient perspective um, encourage the team to like, you know, stay connected with us or refer to us or just from the, you know, just from the patient perspective alone, like how important it was for them um, through their transplant process. So I think that could be um, a good resource, a, a good resource, especially if you have limited staff or time. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, so next question, um, can I what other support can I get at staying at these houses? Is there other support other than just the house itself? What other um, support networks are out there? A critical component, I think, to recovery is peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Um, and that can come in a variety of ways for us because we are, um, we don't have a physical structure yet. For us, it is largely pairing, um, either myself or another patient with the new patient and their family to walk them through. We have caregiver to caregiver, peer to peer mentoring, as well as patient to patient, peer to peer mentoring. And um, to me, that's critical. I know it was critical with my own transplant adventure to find somebody who was doing the post transplant thing well, and, um, and just follow them on their adventure and, um, and, model my recovery for lack of a better word after hers and and providing people who are able to model recovery well for the new patients coming in through um through transplant is a huge gift um to the patients to the families um to everyone involved actually to the mentees as well as the mentors I'll add to that, um, you know, meals are not to be overlooked. Uh, it can really be a cost savings if the house you're staying at provides meals. Uh, here, we're not quite as sophisticated yet as Gift of Life Howie House is, but um, we have gift, we have meals twice a week, a dinner and a breakfast. The breakfast is actually cooked and provided by our social worker, so you get time with her if you come to breakfast as well. So that can be just a big help because I know when we're under stress, we tend to eat the quickest thing, which isn't always the healthiest thing. So meals are huge and the peer-to-peer -peer support that happens during them. Um, to have a professional social worker on your staff um, and get the one-on-one -on -one counsel that they can provide is um, wonderful. 
Um, we've had a, a range of different uh, additional supports, you know, more active pre-pandemic, and we're trying to inch our way back, but some of those things have been chair massage, yoga, meditation, um, certainly the support groups. Um, I mentioned our AA group for people that are trying to stay sober so they can either be listed or keep the organ that they <clears throat> received. Um, Sometimes we've had rides provided by volunteers or volunteers that would go out and do your grocery shopping for you if you would like. Um, so some of the things, the supports that get created depend on who's here with us and what they need and staying uh, tuned into that. Um, I haven't mentioned, but we also have a dog here. We have a golden retriever and <laughs> I never dreamed how popular he would be. I knew he would be liked, but... Um, his name is Benson. We call him Benson the Butler. He's on. He's asleep on the floor near me now. But sometimes that's a perk at these houses as well. Elaine, does he live there? No, he lives with me, and he comes in every day. He oh. um, started coming when he was seven weeks old, so he's oh. really very, very comfortable here. Yeah, he's adorable. Yeah, Benson, you want to come say hi? Come, come. Oh, yeah. yeah, we All have right. a um a therapy dog. Oh my goodness. Oh there he I is. Love it. Hi, everybody. Um, oh. And that's something too that people don't really consider if they have to be away for a while and leaving their pets and the therapeutic nature of just having animals is really hard. We um partnered with a few therapy dog organizations as well, and it's wonderful because they do it as a volunteer. And um one of our volunteers is actually in a donor family. Her son died tragically in an accident and became an organ donor. And it and she brings her um dog in once a month. And it's just to be able for patients also, recipients to connect to the donation side of it is just really impactful. Um, but like Elaine said, the meal thing, I think people's guards are down when they're eating and that really opens up people to share and support. And also something Elaine shared earlier, which is kind of funny about, you know, people who don't think they need the support. Um, I always tell those people like, well, maybe you can give support because there's a lot of people who need it. And they don't see that as like a way into actually being supported also. Um, and then lastly, of course, because I have to promote our program, we started the program to support families um, virtually. And we just have really built it up over the last year. And we have lots of education webinars that have been recorded about different transplant aspects. Um, one that's pretty popular is like, how does the organ actually get from a donor to the recipient? Because a lot of recipients really don't know that whole process um, and our virtual support groups. So I do encourage people um, to really uh, try to access our online program since it's open and available to anyone and, and could be a really helpful um, resource. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it all comes back to, um, like Teresa said earlier, uh, each transplant and each patient is completely different. So the support looks different for each one, depending on what they need. I love that. Um, so yeah, so we're coming to an end, everybody. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, if you have any questions that were not addressed uh, in today's webinar, please reach out to us at info at chrisklugfoundation.org. Uh, we've included the email in the chat, and if you're interested in learning more about any of the organizations that were mentioned today, um, please also hit the links in the chat. Um, next month, we are looking at myths and misconceptions of organ donation and then donor families in October. Please join us for those and check out our new toolkit that's been totally rebranded recently. Um, all about organ donation and transplantation. So we hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us, everyone.